brain and the vision behind this incredible show, Breaking Bad. So please give an incredible welcome to Mr. Vince Gilligan. Some questions from Twitter. Uh, um, uh, this is a tweet uh, uh, from at Molly Faraday, whose name is Molly Faraday. If you had to pick uh, one moment or line as the defining point for the series, what would it be? I know that's a you know that's a very hard question, um, uh, but um, can you try to answer uh, it because Molly asked. Uh, gosh. Uh... Well, the line I keep hearing quoted back all the time is, "I am either I am the danger or I am the one who knocks," and that was uh, that was uh, fun to hear that one repeated back so much. I was actually in a store uh, on uh, Granville Island just yesterday. This very cool uh, hip store with a lot of fun items, and and there was a T-shirt that said, "I am the one who knocks," and that was awesome, uh, <laughs> and completely unlicensed. So. Uh, <laughs> So I, I called the I called the Sony lawyers and had them shut down, but uh, I, had to, I didn't do that. So that uh, that's fun seeing that one. I love I love I actually love seeing that kind of stuff, licensed or not. And uh, I guess uh, the the moment uh, the moment that people I don't know it depends on what season we're talking, but uh, all that stuff coming through the ceiling, you know, the bathtub melting through that was that was a uh, that was a highlight or a low light if you you know. Uh, and I guess maybe uh, Walt watching Jane expire and not lifting a finger to save her, that was, that was one of those key moments, I guess. I love how you talk about that moment like you didn't make it up. Like, oh, what a oh bad man, guy. Why that did he bastard. Do that? <laughs> He's heartless. Um, uh, this question kind of dovetails into my next line of questioning because I, I, I especially, I feel like at the end of life, uh, your life flashes before your eyes. Uh, at least that's that's what they say. And I, I, I do think it's worth uh, visiting, uh, revisiting the beginning. Um, and, and I do want to talk about the pilot and the creative process uh, around the beginning of the show. But the, uh, to, just to kick it off, this question is from uh, from Ander Gatt uh, from Facebook, and uh, I, I don't know if that's a, 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 a male or a female. They ask, do you remember when and how you came up with the concept for Breaking Bad? Yes, I uh, was on the phone to a, a buddy of mine named Tom Schnauz, uh, who is a guy, one of my oldest friends, I've known him since 1986, when he and I went to New York University Film School together. And uh, he wound up being a, uh, a writer, along with uh, me, on The X-Files, uh, which we shot up here in beautiful Vancouver for, for five years. Yay, Vancouver! Also, by the way, I want to give a shout out to uh, today is the 125th birthday of Stanley Park. Wow. So congratulations, Stanley Park. Wow. Today. Weird. Yeah, today is September 27th, 1888. Excellent. Yeah, but I digress. Uh, uh, so I'm talking to my buddy Tom one day in 2004. And X-Files had ended in 2002, and we were two years out from that job that we both loved very much. That was uh, a very close second as far as favorite jobs go for me with, with Breaking Bad being first. But at that point in time, we had been basically unemployed for two years. And we were talking about, now, now what do we do for a living? You know, do we go, do we greet people entering the door at Walmart? Do we, uh, you know... Uh, You'd be very good at that. I, <laughs> I'd like to think I'd be good at something other than this one job. But... Uh, uh, he said, uh, I don't know why it came up exactly, but uh, something to do with a, an article in the New York Times about meth labs. But he suggested we, we put a meth lab in the back of an RV and drive around America and, and make money. And he's, you have to understand, uh, Tom, to understand his sense of humor. But uh, he, he was joking. But, but in that moment, and I've, 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 I've seldom had this kind of a, a moment in my life, you had that, that sort of Archimedes in the bathtub kind of eureka moment where it's like this character kind of popped into my head. And, and in hindsight, I think what intrigued me about him was these were two you know, schlubby middle-aged guys talking about being criminals. And, and it occurred to me, if, you know, I'd, I'd be interested to see uh, an exploration of a character like me or like Tom who 
for whatever forces for whatever forces driving him would you know would, would break bad would become a bad guy and uh, I thought that was very interesting and and that's that was the genesis of the idea and that phone call. There's a there's a rumor out there that you've actually been manufacturing real meth <laughs> while while making the show. So is that is that happening? If that is were that true, true, we would have been on budget. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, going back to the pilot, can you just uh, talk us through, a, you know, now that we've got the inception of the idea, a little bit about the origin of the show, um, you know, the, the, the writing of the script, setting it up at AMC, uh, resistance that you may or may not have met, uh, as, you t as you told other people, this, uh, this Archimedes, I you know, this idea of like, oh, oh my God, like, I just had this amazing idea. Um, what, what was the resistance and what was your response to it? Because in, uh, in my opinion, like, nothing great has ever existed without someone saying, that's the stupidest thing that I've ever heard and it'll never work. Um, and uh, I was one of those people. And uh, uh, kind of what were the struggles uh, to kind of get to the moment that you were standing on the set and you're calling, you're calling action on the first day of, of photography? You know, in hindsight, I mean, and by the way, every movie you've ever seen, good or bad, and every TV show you've ever seen, good or bad, has a story behind it, I guarantee you, of, of I mean, I suppose there are exceptions, but most all of them have, have the history of all the people who said no to it. And obviously all it takes is the one right person at the right time to say yes. Having said that, I've pitched a lot of ideas over the 20-some over the years I've been doing this, uh, movies, both in movies and TV, that I thought were a lot more immediately palatable and, and saleable, sellable, whatever the word is, that nobody said yes to. So all of that long-winded preamble to say selling this surprisingly, as odd as an idea as it is, is out there an idea for a TV show as it is, was not that hard, really. There were not that many places to sell it to. Uh, in, in the U.S. TV industry in 2005, uh, there were really only three potential buyers as we saw it. There was HBO and there was Showtime and there was FX. Uh, we did not even think of going to any of the, uh, the four uh, broadcast networks because we just knew this, this show was too dark and weird and, and kind of R-rated and, you know, the whole meth angle. It would just would have never, it would have been a waste of their time. It would have been a waste of our time. Uh, so we... Uh, we ultimately uh, uh, got got uh, passed on uh, very very nicely uh, by most of those folks that I mentioned uh, that we pitched to, and and I thought this thing was deader than a than a doornail. And then the AMC network came along, and uh, and and one of my agents called me up and said, uh, "Hey, you know this thing that you thought was dead, uh, you, you know your 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 uh, Breaking Bad thing." Uh, I took the liberty of sending it to the AMC network. You heard of them? I said, "Yeah, AMC network. That's the the channel that shows, you know, that that uh, you know shows Porky's two over and over and over again." <laughs> and and I said, uh, "What? Why would you do that?" He says, "Well, you know." I said, "Why didn't you, you know, just send it to the Food Network? Because it's a show about cooking, you know." <laughs> and uh, and he said, "AMC is gearing up to do scripted original programming. They've got they've got something. I don't know what it's about. It's something called Mad Men." That is about to. Uh, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, I had not none of us had heard of it at the time, and of course, it turned out to be uh, an absolute phenomenon, as we all know, and a great show. And uh, that was AMC's first uh, first Grand Slam home run right out of the right out of the gate. Uh, at their first at bat, I guess is the proper sports analogy. And uh, and then uh, they they bought. Lo and behold, they bought they bought us. They bought uh, Breaking Bad. And. Um, in hindsight, it does not seem it was that hard. I don't have uh, a wonderful, uh, dramatic, woeful tale of, of, of hard-fought, uh, you know, victory. Uh, it, it was not that hard compared to some other pitches I've given along the way. Awesome. Uh, do you remember the, the first scene of the show that you shot? Um, mm -hmm. You directed it, obviously, but, you know, what, what, was, what was the very first scene that you shot chronologically? Uh, the first scene we shot in the pilot, my first day of directing. It was a very big day, and we, we sort of knew we were not going to make it. We were sort of overscheduled. We were too ambitious. I was very worried about starting off and failing to meet the schedule on the first day. But it was the sequence in the pilot where Walt is wearing the goofy white uh, bulletproof vest, and he's sitting in the back of Hank's uh, car, and he's witnessing the, the, the meth bust. 
And it's, it's a scene when he first uh, lays eyes on Jesse Pinkman when Jesse falls off the roof. But I think the first shot was, uh, was the three guys in the car having the preamble before the bust went down. And I was scared out of my mind. I mean, I directed uh, before, but only twice, only, only two episodes of, of X-Files. And I was just uh, thinking, man, I, I cannot fail. This is, <laughs> could bring down this entire fledgling network. I, that's being overly dramatic. I don't know if that would have been the case. <laughs> But I, I, I would have, uh, I would have, uh, it would have been embarrassing. It would have been humiliating. So, you, 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 you mentioned uh, uh, Jesse, and um, and I, I think probably for all of us who have followed the show uh, religiously, we've all heard that uh, the original plan was to was that Jesse wasn't going to survive uh, the first season, or, or uh, and, and I, I'm curious. Um, the obvious question is what you know. Why did you change your mind? But I think that the answer is obvious as well, which is that Aaron is incredible, and, and obviously his uh, his chemistry uh, with Brian was even more so. But but I'm not sure that I've ever heard you be asked how he was going to be killed. Um, do you know what was there other than just the arbitrary? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna kill this guy off. But had you had you talked at all about how it was gonna happen and who was gonna do it? We didn't nail it down completely, but it probably would have played out something along the lines of uh, Tuco Salamanca. Might have been him, for instance. Uh, I, the, the best pitch I had was he was going to die in a uh, horrifically cinematic manner, <laughs> and uh, but I never figured out exactly how. But it would have been unpleasant, and uh, and it would have. Uh, and, and and you know, for those of you in the audience who are writers, you can you can uh, you can probably tell. Where we're coming from when we talk about some of this stuff, it's that's a bit of a schematic in a writer's uh, sense. That's a bit of a schematic sequence. Um, it's not so much organic as schematic in the sense of I was thinking ahead, thinking, okay, probably what would be cool is we you know we kill off this character. He we need him just long enough for for him to give Walt his proper entree into the uh, into the meth business, into the world of criminality, and then he will have served his purpose. And then, in a schematic sense, let's kill him off uh, in a horrifying fashion, so that then that moment can be fuel for Walt uh, to uh, to be angry as hell and want revenge, and, and that'll propel the uh, the plot forward in season two. And you realize once you start casting these parts and 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 working with these actors, you you you, you tend to become less schematic and more organic. You start to realize, you know, first of all, look at what's right in front of me. This, this, this young actor who, you know, by, you know, if there's any justice in the world is going to be a big star. Be crazy, yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's take these, these wonderful, this wonderful uh, uh, opportunity we have to, to, to uh, explore this character more fully and not worry about uh, you know being uh, too overly mechanistic in our storytelling, but just let's explore these characters some more. And that's what I love about TV: the opportunity to to explore these things together as a group of people, as a group of collaborators, both in front of the camera and behind it. And also the you know the things that you need, you find that you you don't need at least in terms of plot. For you know, for example, Walt clearly didn't need Jesse to be killed to be angry. Yes. Um, he, he finds it from so many other places. Uh, um, you know, just a, just a brief uh, interview uh, uh, with Grey Matter is enough to uh, get the clenched fist. Um, uh, uh, we actually, um, since we're, we're, we're uh, flash forwarding you know, from the pilot, and, and I want to talk about that, um, that narrative device a, a little bit later, um, we, we revisited the pilot uh, at the beginning of, uh, of Ozymandias. And, you know, it's obviously, it's a simpler time. We're seeing, it, it was just so shocking to see Walt and Jesse in, in that phase of their relationship and then to see Walt uh, call Skyler and she doesn't know and she's still selling things on eBay and he's going to pick up a pizza. And um, uh, I, I, obviously you put it there to kind of give us a, you know, a sharp contrast also where geographically in the same place. But um, I was just wondering, could you talk us through a little bit what it was like to be back in the RV again after all that time? That was really interesting on a lot of levels because that scene, that teaser, was, was shot on the last day of production. 
That was, that was obviously the third from the last episode, but that was the very last thing that was shot. Uh, and at the end of that sequence, which was directed by Ryan Johnson, I, I directed the final episode. And by the way, let's Ryan give it Johnson. up for Ozzy Mandius. Yeah. I mean, pr- yeah. an amazing episode, like incredible, really amazing. Yeah. Ryan Johnson, uh, if, uh, if you're not familiar with his work as a movie director, uh, do yourself a favor and rent the movie Brick and the Brothers Bloom and uh, Looper. He's a brilliant director. And he directed that episode, and that episode was written by Vancouver's own Moira Wally Beckett, who is a brilliant writer from right here in BC. She did a great job. And uh, I finished up directing the final episode, the one that airs uh, Sunday night, uh, the day before, and then we had that pickup. And we had to hold off that, ep- that, that teaser until last because um, it had to do with the hair, the facial hair, uh, to, to put the beard on properly. No, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it, Walt, I'm sorry. Walt was obviously clean shaven. He just had the mustache. So uh, you, you really, as, as amazing as, as prosthetic makeup is nowadays, there's really no way to cover a beard with like a skinhead wig kind of a thing. So Brian had to be clean shaven, and the only time to do that was on the very last day of shooting. So that's why we scheduled it that way. So I had the wonderful pleasure of, of getting to be in Tahajali, this uh, uh, reservation out uh, 40 miles uh, west of, of, of Albuquerque, and I got to hang out on the set and, and not be needed at all. I just got to hang out with my camera and take pictures of everybody and wander around. Uh, Ryan and Moira didn't need me. Uh, the, the, the cast and crew didn't need me, and, and that was a wonderful thing, and I just got to be a, it's like a tourist on the set, and at the end of that teaser at the end of that day of shooting, at the end of that sequence, uh, uh, our, our very thoughtful producers uh, broke out a whole bunch of bottles of champagne, and uh, we, uh, everybody uh, teared up and, and hugged each other, and it was just a, it was a very touching uh, moment that we all, that we all, uh, that I won't, I can't speak for anyone else, but I won't soon forget it. It was wonderful. Wow. Um, uh, s- some more, uh, some more fan questions, including uh, our, our contest winners. This question is from uh, Facebook. Vince, you have mentioned that uh, Walter White's arc has been planned from day one, so my question is this. Has the performance of Brian Cranston allowed you to push the character further than you had planned? Uh, and if so, uh, can you offer any examples? And that's from uh, Scott Kukarutz. Uh, uh, if you can pronounce it, give it a shot. Cucur- Cucaroots. Thank you, Scott. Cucaroots. I like that. That's a good name. Scott is available to pop out of a clock for any of you who are interested. <laughs> An excellent question, Scott. Um, yes and no, I had, I had it planned out. And I'll, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, Yes, I, I, we always had in mind that we were going to take our good guy and turn him into our bad guy. That, that was a solid plan, and we abided by that for, for six years. We, we knew we'd take the good guy and turn him into the bad guy. Having said that, um, that does not mean in any way, shape, or form that I knew plot-wise what was going to happen uh, year after year or even moment to moment within any one episode. Uh, we... I had certain ideas when, when I was writing the pilot, and, and, and even before writing it, when I was pitching the pilot to, to our, our, our studio and our network, I had certain ideas, most of which I've completely forgotten by now, and I would pitch them, and they'd say, oh, that sounds cool. And then what happens in a TV show, you hire uh, writers, and you hope that they're going to be wonderful, and, and, and in my case, they were. I had six excellent writers. Uh, and we, we all would sit around together for hours on end and, and come up with the actual plot moments, you know, the plot beats. And um, so, so having said all of that, it was a constant uh, voyage of discovery to, to figure out what Walt was going to do day in and day out. And the way, the best way we got to those moments was, was organically, which is to say, you know, it wasn't, oh, wouldn't this be cool if this happened? Wouldn't it be cool if that happened? Admittedly, every now and then we did that, but our, our finest moments in the writer's room were when we, we said to ourselves, what does Walt want right now? What's his greatest hope? What's his deepest fear? What's driving him? And therefore, what does he want to do next? 
And the greatest moments in a writer's room, I find, I, I found this in the X-Files writing for uh, Mulder and Scully, the greatest moments were, and this sounds kind of weird if, if you haven't experienced it, uh, but it really is true. Sometimes the greatest moments are you don't feel like you're a writer, you feel like you're a court stenographer. And like I'd hear sometimes Mulder and Scully arguing in my head, and I just start typing it down. And, and, they have and, pills for that. Huh? Yeah. They have pills for yeah, that? Yeah, there are. <laughs> don't take them, but, they're, but they exist. They have this liquid called vodka, is yeah. it? Uh, but, uh, and you've had that experience, haven't you? you, you, know, you know, Absolutely. You know what I'm talking Especially about? Especially for all the bad stuff. It was channeled through me. But it's uh, like, it's a wonderful feeling when, 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 when the storytelling derives from a, this organic process. Not to say we didn't cheat every now and then, or, and, you know, every now and then we would say, hey, this would be a cool scene with a, I don't know, a guy's head on a turtle or whatever. How do we get to that? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> so all of that long-winded way of answering, uh, did, did Walt ever surprise me? I guess he surprised all of us, uh, organically speaking, uh, when he watched Jane die. I think uh, that came up in the writer's room, and and, uh, uh, and by the way, all these ideas were not mine, but I think that idea was mine. And I think when I pitched it, the other writers were, looked at me kind of aghast and said, man, I think my first pitch was he doesn't just watch her die and do nothing. I think my first pitch was that he shoots her up with a second dose of heroin. And, and they were like, you're a sick bastard. And, uh, <laughs> And then, I, and then it, it, it wound up being whittled down, and rightly so, to if she starts to choke, what if he did not attempt to save her? Uh, because he's got reasons uh, to not save her. He said that would be uh, very terrible and, and soul-killing, but on the other hand, it would, it would make his life a whole lot easier in this moment. So that was one of those moments uh, where he, his darkness surprised us. And it actually was the one moment it surprised the studio and the network. And they were, they were very courageous for six years, but that was the one time I can think of where they called up. And they, and they didn't, they didn't flow up, throw up the red, the, the, they didn't wave the red flag, whatever the expression is. They didn't, they didn't say don't do it, but they did say let's talk about it. They said we don't fear him being this dark and evil, we just fear it happening only 18 or 19 episodes into the run of the series. You know, it did, how much room, how much darker can he get from here? So, so it, which was a very valid question. And, uh, and none of us knew at the time just how much darker he could get. I couldn't pitch him what was going to happen later. So that's uh, the fun process. You don't really quite know where you're going. I was going to ask you about that moment later, but, but, but since we're on it now, I, I just want to say as a fan, and I, I don't know how many of you guys I speak for, but when we got to that moment in the show, and he's standing there uh, at the foot of the bed, and it's happening, I just remember thinking, he's not going to do anything. And, and, and I feel like if he had done something to help her, it would have been a betrayal. Like, I wasn't happy about the fact that he wasn't going to do anything, but it felt like in that moment, that, ha that, that had to be what happened. So, uh, uh, at least on, on my, I guess that makes me a dark fucker too, but... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, thank you. No, the, you're... you're uh, <laughs> thank you for killing I'm, Jane. Thank I'm you. Glad, I'm, I'm glad that was she has, a, she has a sitcom now. She's doing great. <laughs> she does. Yes. Kristen Ritter. Yeah. She's just cute as she can be, too. Wonderful. I love her. Um, <laughs> She's alive and well. Yeah. Don't worry about her. Just, just choking on her own vomit, as cute as she can be. Uh, <laughs> another question from Twitter. Uh, this is from uh, Ames uh, uh, Vung, or Vung. Um, uh, and the tweet was, uh, how do you, uh, this is uh, very apropos actually, how do you decide who you kill off and who you let live and, uh, and what was the hardest death to figure out? And I, I, I think that that's, that's different than what was the hardest death to, to actually write or execute, but just in terms of, you know, I would imagine the one that we just watched um, here was just in terms of the mechanics. Uh, right up there. You're absolutely right. The hardest one to figure out was the one you just saw because this is the guy, Gus Fring, who's arguably the only guy, uh, and there are a lot of smart, good guys and bad guys on Breaking Bad, but the, arguably the smartest cat who ever came down the pike on this show was Gustavo Fring. It's very defensively arguable that he was smarter than Walt, and Walt really had to, 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 uh, to uh, you know, raise his game in order to defeat this guy. And what you don't want, and again, from a writer's point of view, or I'm sure a viewer's point of view for that matter, you don't want your really uh, 
wonderful, charismatic, brilliant bad guy to, to suddenly get stupid in the 11th hour just so that the good guy can win. Of course, I use the terms good and bad guy here pretty relatively. <laughs> but, uh, but, but loosely. We, loosely, loosely, loosely yes. very loosely I'm using those. But uh, we, we knew that, uh, you know, everyone has an Achilles heel, and, and we figured that uh, Gustavo Fring's Achilles heel could not be uh, intellectual, but it had to be emotional. And so we went to the trouble many episodes prior to, to this one of him, of setting up his, his uh, just rage uh, against the character of Tio Salamanca, uh, played by the wonderful Mark Margolis. And, uh, and that was, we had to play a, a, a deeper game than, than, than we were accustomed to trying, to, trying to figure all that out. So that was the hardest death to figure out because it had to be, had to be nuts on. It had to be, uh, it had to be earned. Uh, the toughest uh, death for the crew, I can tell you, was, was Mike Ermentrop, played by Jonathan Banks. That was... Give it up. Uh, that one was... Uh, I can tell you that my friend Tom Schnauz, who I was telling the story about earlier, about being on the phone with him back in 2004, he wrote and directed that episode. It was the first uh, time since NYU Film School that he had actually directed, and he did a fantastic job. And it was tough. I was not there on the set, but he was telling me there by the, the Rio Grande there, by the river where, where all that took place. He said it was a very tough day because uh, the crew kept, uh, Jonathan Banks kept, kept, you know, tearing up. And the crew, uh, the crew just loved him. Uh, the crew was so tight-knit and wonderful. They, uh, somebody in the crew made black armbands or, or bought them, and everyone was wearing a black armband on the, on the crew that day in honor of Jonathan. And, uh, and they got the, the final bit of it just as the sun was going down, just as the sun was about to become, you know, so it was about to be so dark that it would be unshootable. And uh, that was, uh, I wish I had been there for, I wish I had been on the set more often. I was mostly in the writer's room at Burbank, and, and the set was, was where all the fun was happening. Uh, an another question from Twitter, um, uh, and this is from uh, Adam Grossman. Uh, for such a perfectly crafted story, what has been the most unexpected change to how you first envisioned it? That's a tough one. Most you can pass. Most unexpected change. Oh, man. Let me think about that, because, you know, that's a great question, but I don't have a great answer for it. The most unexpected change. I think we'll just accept killing Jesse, oh, you know, already stated, unless you... Uh, unless you want to come up with something else. <laughs> Reading the question, I'm like, Jesus, that's a tough one. That is. Uh, that's a good question. The good ones are the tough ones. Uh, what, what else was unexpected? Well, I'll tell you, all right, I, I don't know if it's the most. I have trouble with superlatives. I, I, you say what, you ask me what my favorite episode is or favorite character. What, I, I can't narrow it down to favorites or least favorites or whatever. But one that springs to mind, if this is useful, is that... Um, uh, we really love the character of Tio Salamanca at the end of, uh, I'm sorry, not, uh, yeah, we loved him too. Tuco Salamanca, his, his, uh, his nephew, uh, crazy uh, guy snorting meth off the tip of a buoy knife and uh, played by the excellent actor uh, Raymond Cruz. He was our bad guy uh, at the end of season one, at the beginning of season two, and we were going to have all kinds of fun with him. And then, unfortunately, and, and the actor, Ray, Raymond Cruz, a great guy, uh, he very much wanted to, to participate, but he was uh, contractually obligated to the TV series The Closer. So we barely got him shot out in that, in that big episode at the beginning of season two where he is out in the middle of the boonies with, with his uh, uncle, with, with, with his T.O. in the wheelchair and then all that, all that sequence with the big shootout with Hank. We barely got that thing scheduled because the folks at the closer were very nice, but they, they couldn't break them out very, very much. So the biggest change probably in season two was uh, we were going to have this guy be our bad guy for like 13 episodes straight, and uh, it just would not come to pass. It just uh, we couldn't make it happen. So we had to invent another bad guy uh, kind of on the fly, and that's where uh, Gustavo Fring came from. Gustavo Fring, as, as a bad guy, was everything uh, Tuco was not. He was not wild-eyed and crazy and foaming at the mouth and uh, a user of his own product. He was very businesslike and buttoned down and proper and soft-spoken and, 
And of course, as we learned as the series went on, he could be even scarier, even scarier than a guy like uh, Tuco. So, uh, you know, that's one of those things. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes life gives you lemons. Sometimes uh, your your TV show gives you lemons, and you you kind of have to make lemonade. And that was a that was a good example of that. Uh, in the second season of of, of Lost, we had a, an amazing character, Mr. Echo, who uh, we had plotted. You know, a multi-season. Uh, arc for it and all these great ideas. The actor just did not want to be in Hawaii at all. He was from London, Ottawa, an amazing actor. He was like, I'm leaving. Like, I'm gone. Kill me off, please. And so uh, we were like, no, you can't leave. We have this whole thing worked out for you. And, but at the same time, uh, uh, we had cast uh, Michael Emerson uh, in, in the middle uh, uh, of that season. And then, uh, and then uh, Ian Cusick, this guy uh, played a character named Desmond towards the end. We're like, we should, we'll just write for those guys and cover our asses. And they ended up, you know, uh, it, it, it happened as a direct result of losing Adewale. So it is exactly the same situation when people say, like, you know, are you making it up as you go along? You're like, well, when the closer comes a calling, you, uh, exactly. you have no choice. Exactly. Michael Emerson, by the way, such, he was so great on Lost. He's such a fine actor. I worked with him in the last episode of The X-Files I ever wrote and directed. He played this damaged uh, man-child who had these uh, astounding psychic powers, and he loved the Brady Bunch. So he created, oh, yeah, he created the world of the Brady Bunch sure. uh, in his own house. And, uh, yeah, he's a, great, he's a great guy. He really is. Um, uh, another question from, uh, from Twitter. This is from uh, another, great, uh, oh, another great segue uh, from at dscully324. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, Caroline is the, her actual name. Um, what for you personally is the most memorable scene in Breaking Bad and why? Now that you've told us that you don't like to use superlatives. So a, a very memorable scene um, that can't be Jane dying because you already used it. Because I've already yeah. used that one. Oh, uh, man. Um, very memorable scene. Oh, man. There's, it's a hard... Uh, all right, I'll, just, I'll do this like, uh, you know, like with the Rorschach test, like what pops into your brain. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the head on the tortoise. That pops into my head. Uh, that was a fun one. I still have the head, by the way. I've got it in, a, in, a, in an igloo cooler. And uh, it's, it's a, a perfect life cast of the actor Danny Trejo. And it's cast in silicone. And it, is, it smells kind of funky. And it is really creepy to touch. Because it feels like, I guess, I, I'm never having felt it, thank God. But it feels kind of like corpse skin. And... And uh, this uh, low-budget movie that had Danny Trejo in it, uh, I guess in the movie he had his head lopped off. They borrowed it from us. <laughs> so they didn't have to make their own, which I thought was very nice of us. Uh, but that, that scene was, uh, that was, uh, that was directed by a, a gentleman named Felix Alcala, who did a wonderful job with that sequence. And that one always springs to mind. In the writer's room, I was very proud of that moment. I think all of us writers were. We said, okay, Okay, human head on a tortoise, big desert tortoise. Man, this is great. This is going to be very iconic. People are going to remember this. Let's all go to lunch. Let's feel good about today. I might have a beer. And then George Masters, one of our writer-producers, said, because he always sat like this in the room, and he's with his arms crossed leaning back, and he says, and then the head should blow up. <laughs> and I said, George, for fuck's sake, man, it's like... Well, quit while you're ahead here, man. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> yeah. like, and then I, we thought about it. We said, you know, George is right. Yeah. So yeah. we've got to have a button to the scene. Might as well be the head blowing up. Yeah. Where does one keep Danny Trejo's head? Like, where, 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 where is it? You know, it's the scariest answer I could give <laughs> is the true answer, which is I don't quite know at this moment in time where, where Danny Trejo's head is. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's somewhere in, on my property somewhere, but I'm not sure where. I'd have a hard time putting my hands on Danny Trejo's head at this exact moment. Okay. Um, we've got, uh, there was a contest, uh, a contest for super fans of Breaking Bad, and, and, uh, and the, uh, the prize was that they got to come to this event and ask the, ask the question in person. So I believe that we have our two contest winners. Uh, are they here? Are they? Yes, I, I believe they are. Come on down. We have uh, Di Manuel and, uh, and Phil Johnston. We're going to come down and ask their questions in person uh, down on either side of the 
of the auditorium. Awesome. Right on. Excellent. I like that look. You guys are rocking those suits uh, very, very well. Nice. Uh, uh, your name is, sir? Hi, I'm Phil. Phil, uh, have you been watching the show since the very beginning, or did you catch up? Or I, It was kind of a catch-up. Right around 2012, I uh, caught up to season four. And how does it feel to wear the suit? Oh, it's really warm. Excellent. I know. It, they, you know they, they don't breathe, do they? It's, yeah. very, it's very unpleasant, probably. Yeah. yeah. Feel good. Please <laughs> ask Vince your question, and he will answer it. Oh, hi, Vince. So... Uh, my question is related to what drives the character of Walter White. I noticed this slogan for season five is, remember my name. So it got me thinking that maybe, uh, and it does seem like Walter is driven to be remembered in a way the other characters aren't. So I was thinking, maybe uh, someone in Walter's life uh, forgot about him in a way that he wants to ensure never happens again. So my question is, have you shown us who forgot Walter White in the series so far? And if not, uh, do you have any clues as to who that might be? That's an excellent question. Um, it really I, is. Yeah, it really is. It's an excellent question. Good job. Yeah. Um, you know what, I, 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 think, I think there's a lot of depth to that question. I think you're right on the money. I, I don't know, it's an interesting thing when you write a character. It's easy when you write a character to think there's, there's one precipitating moment in a character's life where it all goes right or it all goes wrong, typically in drama. It's, it's the moment where it all goes wrong. And I think in, in strictly meat and potatoes dramatic terms, I would have to point to uh, gray matter technology, uh, technologies and, and Gretchen and Elliot, who we saw, we've seen a couple times uh, sprinkled throughout the series, and most recently we saw them in last week's episode on, on the Charlie Rose Show. Uh, but I would offer the thought that uh, they may be, uh, that may have been a, a very important precipitating moment in Walt's life, but it, it's kind of, in real life we just, and this is not real life, he's a, he's a TV character, but, but I like to think of him sometimes, I, I, or I like to try to examine him as if he were a real guy. And I think Walt is a guy, I think you're right on the money with a lot of those ideas, I think Walt is a guy who's very prideful and very full of ego. He's got this overweening ego. He's always got to be the best at, at chemistry, the best at making, you know, crystal meth, the best Heisenberg, the best drug kingpin, because he, it, it feels like he missed his opportunity to do something more positive and legitimate with his life. And the real crime of, the, of, of, of his life, or, or what he allowed it to become perhaps, is that he could have had that level of su success or something close to it in, 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 the, uh, in the legitimate world. He could have been, as he says at one point uh, in, in, our, in our season 5A, he, sees, he says to, to, to Jesse, you know, I could have been part of this uh, two point blah blah billion dollar corporation, gray matter, and then the way he sees it, his, his birthright was stolen from him. I would, I would argue that, that, that Walt is the, is the author and engineer of his own miseries, and certainly those of his family. But even before he became a, a drug kingpin, if he was sleepwalking through life, maybe that's on him and nobody else. Maybe he's not a victim of, of chicanery or, 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 or you know, uh, you know, larceny on the, on the part of other people stealing from him. Maybe he stole his own. He robbed himself. He robbed himself of his own happier life he could have had. So, but uh, good question. Thank nice. You. So, in other words, you make your own bed, you lie in it, yeah. then you choke on your own vomit while somebody watches. <laughs> it. Yes. Okay, so uh, our, our, next, uh, our next contest winner, it, it, uh, your, your name, can you pronounce yeah, it, is it Die? It's Die. Die. Manuel. Uh, and how long have you been watching the show? Uh, since season one, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I have to admit that my anxiety levels got really, really high after season one, and I had to wait for season two and season three to play out and watch them all at once, back to back. Because right right I just on. couldn't handle the anticipation between episodes. <laughs> Uh, how, are you, how are you feeling right now? Oh, dude, I am so stressed. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I didn't know. 
straight up. <laughs> but would you would you feel better if, say, you could sleep with Danny Trejo's head? <laughs> we could make that uh, happen. I'd feel like Godfather for uh, sure. <laughs> uh, please, Di, ask your question of Vince. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, without. I understand why I would be wearing tidy whiteies under this. I mean, wearing clothes under this thing, it's freaking yeah. hot, It's man. hot, right? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my question was, you know, we all draw inspiration from different things in life. And as someone who's created and fleshed out some incredible characters, extremely memorable, my, my question was, how many of those characters might be modeled off real people in your life? And uh, do those individuals know? <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Another excellent question. Um, uh, not characters per se, but names of characters most definitely. My girlfriend Holly, first and foremost, uh, uh, who's in the audience uh, somewhere. Holly, uh, say mama for uh, us. <laughs> Where are you? Uh, there she is. And uh, so, so Holly, of course, is the name of, uh, of the White's uh, little baby girl. Uh, and um, Holly's brother, Hank, uh, is uh, in real life is a... Is a, is a uh, clinical pharmacologist, uh, clinical pharmacologist, who lives in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina. You guys and get along, you yeah. and Hank? No, I mean, I just, uh, oh yeah, I love <laughs> Hank, yeah. Good. And Hank, and yeah. Hank, I use the name because I love the name, but, right. but Hank, uh, Hank, the real life Hank sounds more like Walter White, but he's not, he's not like Walt, and he's not like Hank. So it's just mostly the name, and, and the idea of someone making their living in the sciences. The, I, I, you know, all, I'm being a little long-winded here, as I tend to be. Uh, so uh, those two examples are not are, are names, essentially. But the one character who is based on anybody, and I realize this in hindsight, and this is embarrassing, is, is Walt is probably kind of based on me. Uh, not Heisenberg. Not, not, <laughs> not, not Walt once he became interesting. But, <laughs> but Walt, Walt prior to becoming interesting probably is the closest... Uh, example I can give you of a character who's based on someone I know. Uh, and, and I didn't even realize this at the time. It's kind of one of those things you realize in hindsight. I realized uh, uh, that I was about to turn uh, 40 years old when I, when I came up with this idea. Uh, and I was thinking, man, you know, uh, midlife crisis, that's going to be a tough one. I'm going to have a bad one, probably. And, and have I done enough with my life thus far? And, and uh, has there been enough excitement? Have I swung for the fences, you know, and all those kind of things you think of as you approach uh, your, your rapidly, uh, uh, you know, dwindling, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, you approach your mortality, whatever the hell I'm trying to say. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Walt is a guy who, who, who lives in fear until he becomes Heisenberg, until that first episode where the seeds are planted and he realizes He's not in the middle of his rather undistinguished up to that point life. He's at the end of his life, and, and he's going to suddenly make hay while the sun is shining. And that is something I find intriguing because I, I, I don't live my life uh, from a place of courage. I, I live it instead from a place of neuroses and fear. And uh, uh, I, I realize that in hindsight. I realize what it really intrigued me about this character was not that he broke bad, not that he was a criminal, not that he you know, uh, cook meth or any of that stuff. That's just set dressing. What really interested me about this guy is he went forward with courage. Unfortunately, he does a great many bad things that, that none of us could get behind. None of us could say, yay, attaboy. But what he does choose to do, he does with courage. And, and, and I, I think that, at the end of the day, was what intrigued me so much about the character. Even though when I first pitched it to the studio and the network, I couldn't have put that into words. It took me five or six years of thinking about this guy day in and day out to finally make that simple realization, so. And if I was your therapist and I was trying to integrate both these questions into one, I would say, who is your gray matter, Vince? Like, who, is, is there, is the there one, some? The one thing I'm proud of, the one thing I've got over Walter White is that. Hair. <laughs> yeah, I got hair. <laughs> Uh, is, is that I, 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 when I was miserable in high school, when I was miserable in college, when I wasn't, you know, when I, when I was not living my life to the fullest as I saw it, whatever, I, I didn't blame anybody else. I realized, you know, uh, my problems were of my own authorship, my own devising. The difference between me and, and, and Walter White, 
really is that he 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 goes out of his way to blame other people, you know, Gretchen and Elliot or uh, you know whatever whatever powers that be. He seems to find other people to blame. Uh, that's one thing I'm proud of. I, I don't go looking for other people to you know anything. Any my failings are my own. I take I take uh, complete uh, ownership of them. So anyway, that's awesome. Um, thank you. no, it is. Thank you for sharing that with us. I mean, you know. I think that's, you know, that's a very, a very intimate confession for, uh, for a space like this. And uh, uh, th again, a, a big round of applause for our two super fans, uh, guys. Uh, uh, yeah, that got weirdly earnest there at the yeah. end, didn't it? And, and, and as your, your prize, Todd, is waiting in the back to, to tie you, leash you up, and get you cooking. So congratulations. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I do want to have a, b before we continue with the questions, just a brief uh, um, shout out to the, uh, uh, let's acknowledge the other writers on the show, um, uh, many of whom have directed episodes as well. And, and obviously, if you, if you could kind of name them uh, in your answer, that would be great. But I guess my question is, and, and this was certainly my experience, um, there's a hive mind that forms, but each writer kind of has their specialty. It's a little bit of a, you know, an A-team. There's, you know, there's the, you know, there's the, you know, the weapons specialist and the, yeah, yeah, and the yeah. one who won't get on planes and, um, you know, and, and someone in the room is like, no, Gomi would never do that. And he's the Gomi guy. Like, he's, he's speaking up for Gomi. So, um, you know, if you could just talk a little bit about the different personalities that make up this, this incredible show, uh, because you acknowledge, you're so gracious. But I, but I also happen to know, uh, in this case, they've, they've, most of them have been there since the very beginning. And Wait, absolutely. Uh, dating back to the first two hires uh, uh, who were with us the whole time, uh, there's Peter Gould, who, by the way, is going to be uh, appearing at, at VIF uh, at, the, at the film festival here next Wednesday. I think he's going to be up on a panel with, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Rick Cleveland, who's also an excellent writer. That'll be a good one for you guys to attend. Uh, Peter Gould, uh, wonderful writer who created the character Saul Goodman, and he and I are gonna are gonna uh, work on this uh, Better Call Saul spinoff together. He's great, and and uh, Peter's superpower in the room was his. Uh, he had several. Uh, one of them was he was excellent. Aside from being, they're they're all wonderful writers. They could all put it on the page. But uh, as you well know, you also want folks uh, who are wonderful in the writer's room and who are constantly helping and, and sometimes even just paying attention. So, you know, you've, you've, so we all have our moments where energy flags in the writer's room or it's sort of like counting ceiling tiles or whatever. Peter was always a constant cheerleader and, and always paying attention and always, always uh, you know, very structurally minded and character minded, was great in the writer's room uh, and also just buoyed me up when I was very depressed. He'd be he his the thing we always made fun of him, he always said, Great things are happening. And that was his catchphrase. And that was wonderful. And uh, that's uh, I loved having Peter in the room. George Masters uh, hired at the same time as Peter. George uh, used to be a lawyer and has also uh, also backpacked all around the world and really led a very interesting life. Wrote a, a novel uh, called Fidali's Way, which is an excellent read. Uh, so, uh, aside from being an excellent writer, George helped us with all the, the legalese and, and told us when we were barking up the wrong tree as far as what the DEA could do and couldn't do vis-a-vis you know, -vis powers of arrest and whatnot, all that kind of stuff. And he wrote some great hard-boiled tough guy stuff. He created the character of Tuco Salamanca and, you know, he'd be the, he's the guy who'd come up with lines like, uh, you know, uh, actually he was, uh, was it? No, he wasn't tight, tight, tight. That was Peter. He was the one who was like, lines like, uh, kicks like a mule with his balls wrapped in duct tape. I remember reading that thinking, well done. <laughs> well done, my friend. I, I salute you, I sir. I salute you. Uh, and then we had uh, Sam Catlin, who is one of the funniest people I've ever met. Uh, Sam directed for the first time uh, an episode that he wrote uh, a couple episodes back uh, uh, that was the one in which... Uh, Walt shows up. Uh, I'm drawing a, I'm like an idiot. I'm drawing a blank on the on the episode titles now. But oh, it was a ra rabid you. dog, rabid dog, yeah. uh, where he shows up. Uh, Walt shows up, and Jesse's not in the house, but the gasoline spilled everywhere, and Walt spends the rest of the hour being told first by Saul and then by his own wife that you got to kill Jesse Pinkman, and at the end of the hour he decides to. Uh, Sam, funny as hell, 
Uh, that's hysterical. <laughs> well, I, I know that's not hysterical. <laughs> but Sam, really, I, I've never laughed so hard uh, at anyone as, as this guy. He's just tremendously funny. Came, came to writing from being an actor and a playwright and then got into screenwriting, uh, as did uh, Moira Wally Beckett from beautiful Vancouver. Uh, she uh, started as a ballerina, actually, and then an actress. I think she had a bit part, she tells me. She didn't want me to go see it but, or rent it, but I think the movie Runaway that was shot up here uh, with Tom Selleck, Michael Crichton movie, I think she was in that. Uh, Gene Simmons is the bad guy in that yeah, movie. Yeah, Gene Simmons. And I think true. Gene yeah. Simmons hit on her, yeah, yeah. I think. Or That's maybe I'm movie. making that up. She's very cute, and I wouldn't be surprised. And she uh, wrote plays as well. And uh, she, she and Ginny Hutchison who used to be my uh, writer's assistant, uh, are our two uh, women on the staff, and they both write some of the best hard-boiled dialogue, the best tough guy dialogue. Moira wrote the sequence uh, directed by uh, uh, Michelle McLaren, another BC girl. Uh, uh, Michelle McLaren, our wonderful producer-director, uh, who directed the most hardcore, badass, hard-boiled, tough guy sequences, and Moira wrote some of them some of those hard-boiled sequences. The two of those ladies together wrote and directed the, the, the episode with that sequence in it. Last year, set to the Nat King Cole song where, where the ten guys get shivved in jail inside of two minutes. And uh, so they, I wouldn't want to cross either of them. Yeah, give it up for <laughs> Shiv. Give shipping. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, you sick fucks. <laughs> and, uh, and Jenny... Uh, who uh, used to be my writer's assistant on the X-Files. Uh, I'm so proud of her. She, she became a staff writer uh, several seasons ago and gets the voice of Hank, of all people. Absolutely, just nuts on perfect. Before we gave her the staff writing job, she would write, uh, Hank had a blog on the AMC website, and, and you would read Hank's musings, in other words, uh, week in and week out. And about she, minerals? About, about anything yeah. and everything, about the yeah. state of the nation, you know, right. all about all this stuff. And she would write this stuff, and I would read it and just marvel and say, where are you channeling this from? This is because, you know, it's just, uh, she just does a great job with that. Let's see, what did I, did I name all three? Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Who am I missing? Uh, and then, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. And then Tom Schnauz, who I talked about, who's my, one of my oldest friends, who uh, also one of the funniest people I've ever met and is great with structure and uh, great in the room. And, you know, they, they were all, uh, it, was, it, was like, uh, it was like murderer's row. I mean, this, uh, in the old, the old uh, athletic sense, it was, uh, these guys were all, they were the A-team. They were great. So, so, so a quick speed round of who wrote it. And maybe you, sometimes these things are hard to remember in writer's rooms, but... The, the memorable ones, you, you tend to, uh, all the memorable quotes on Lost, I did not write. So I, I always remember thinking, oh, I, I wish I had written that, and therefore it, uh, it, it seared itself into my brain. So here are some quotes, and you, uh, hopefully these are not all you, or else it'll, it'll feel like I'm uh, kissing your ass even more. But. So the, fir the first one is, everyone sounds like Meryl Streep with a gun to their head. And that's a, that's a my quote. Uh, I think that was Sam Catlin. It was not me. That was yeah. yeah. I think that was Sam. I think it was. Pretty sure that was Sam. Yeah, that was a great line. But by, by the way, do you know who Meryl Streep sounds like with a gun to her head? <laughs> Sean Connery. It's true. <laughs> Very strange. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 here's a Jesse line. Uh, uh, it's actually an exchange between uh, between Jesse and Badger and Skinny P. Uh, Jesse says. Uh, What's the point of being an outlaw when you got responsibilities? And then Badger says, Darth Vader had responsibility. He was responsible for the Death Star. And then Skinny Pete says, true that, two of them bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever that is, I want to high five them so bad. <laughs> I am drawing a blank. That might have been George Masters. I, I, uh, I'm drawing a blank on that one. Excellent. That was, yeah. we'll, we'll credit it to George. Uh, this, this, this line you, you, you mentioned earlier and is now on a T-shirt, so this person is due, due funds. I'm the one who knocks the whole, the whole speech leading up to that. That was a, that was a Jenny Hutchison episode. And, uh, oh, yeah, that, was, uh, that, was, that turned out uh, very memorable. Yeah. Excellent. And, uh, and my personal favorite, yeah, bitch, magnets. <laughs> Who was that? That was me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, and, and legend has it, you weren't even pitching it as a line. You were just, you were just saying it. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, something you say, and then you think, hey, why don't we do an episode about magnets, you know? Uh, some, uh, some more questions uh, from the fans. Uh, this is a tweet from uh, Art, uh, at Art uh, Baccio, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's sort of presumptive, and, and again, I don't, um, uh, please don't spoil anything or even indicate anything about the final episode, but uh, Walt always had seen Jesse as a son. Why did he give up on him in the end? And let's just say that in the end essentially means at the moment where he decides to, uh, to kill Jesse, perhaps he's changed his mind, maybe he hasn't, we don't know, we don't want to know. But, but, but in that moment. I think Art is talking about that, uh, that episode, Ozymandias, and, and that's, a, that's, for my money, the nastiest thing Walt has ever done, and he's done a lot of nasty things, is, is coldly looking Jesse in the eye. And this is as, Je as he, he pauses Jesse before they put Jesse in the car, ostensibly to take him away and torture him to death. And he's got to twist the knife uh, one last time before he says goodbye forever by saying... I watched Jane die. I could have saved her, but I didn't, which I think is uh, very arguably the, the nastiest thing he's ever done. And I think why he does that is, I'm not saying he's right, but I think where his, where his mind is at in that moment is, this kid, he betrayed me. He did the worst thing you can do in our business. He ratted on his partner. This guy ratted me out to my own brother-in-law. And he led my brother-in-law directly to me. He's, a, he's just a slack-jawed little rat. And, and now my brother-in-law is dead because of him, because of this little bastard who's cowering under this car. And I'm absolutely the one, and I've, and I've just lost, I've just forever, at least in this moment, forevermore, it looks like I'm never going to be Heisenberg again. I, I tried desperately to save my brother-in-law. I offered all the money I've ever made in my life in this lousy business. Everything I've, I've blood, uh, bled and, and sweated and cried for, I, I offer to give up, and my brother-in-law is now dead, and my money is now gone, and I'm going to get revenge on this kid who I think in this one moment is, is the author of all my problems. That's sort of like we were talking about a minute ago. You know, Walt is never the author of his own problems in his, in, in, in his mind. So I think that's where that awful, nasty sadism comes from. It's not, it's not nice, but, I mean, it's, it's earned character-wise in that moment, it, it felt like to us. And to us, and it's bold and nuanced and, and, and amazing. Um, this is uh, another uh, question from Adam Grossman. Uh, and again, if you can't come up with it on the spot. Of all the genius lines, do you have a favorite Saul Goodman uh, uh, line? Uh, a, a moment of Saul's. Uh, Saul has so many, uh, so much comedy gold emanating, uh, falling from his lips. It's hard to hard to nail it down. But I think some of his best stuff was was in the very first uh, episode in which he appeared. I think that first sequence when he comes in uh, uh, in Peter Gould's uh, episode back in season two, and he just goes on this riff to Badger, uh, who is in trouble for for selling meth, and he goes on this this 60 second long tear about. <laughs> Here's what you need to do. I need a cashier's check made out in the amount of four thousand blah blah dollars, and we we can talk about Mastercard eventually, but never American Express. So he gives he's talking about like this. I, I can't even do it justice. I can't remember all the all the words, but this amazing riff he goes on, and then uh, and then Badger, he's not spoken a word about the kid being innocent or guilty or whatnot, and then Badger says, "But you're going to get me off, right?" And he says, uh, he has another couple funny lines, but then he says, son, you're going to get the best criminal defense that money can buy. And I just thought that was, I, that was my favorite probably yet. But I just, there's so much gold that comes out of this guy's mouth. Pure gold. Uh, uh, let's give it up for, for Bob Go Odenkirk and yeah. Saul Goodman. And fortunately for all of us, um, a lot more to come, and I, uh, and I, I don't want to know uh, anything about the spinoff because I, I feel it will betray. We can probably talk more about that after the final episode. Um, uh, here's another question from, uh, from Twitter from Anjula Rasanga, and uh, they asked, Mr. Gilligan, people around the world idolize you as a cult TV god thanks to piracy, downloads, and streaming. What's your take on this? And I'm unclear as to what's your take on being a uh, cult TV god or, or piracy in general, but let's go with piracy. Like, I mean, obviously, 
the show has benefited from it. You're, you know, you're in the zeitgeist. The, there was a massive, unprecedented uh, you know, ratings uptick in, ter uh, in terms of when the show came back for this final run. Um, uh, how, uh, how do you feel about it? You, you can't help but feel ambivalent. You can't help but feel good and bad. I was uh, uh, in uh, Galway, Ireland about three years ago at a, a very nice uh, uh, little uh, film festival, uh, film forum there. And uh, everybody in the room was asked if they had seen, uh, the, the moderator said, how many people, everyone will see a show of hands, how many people have seen Breaking Bad? And, and every hand in the room went up. And then the moderator said, okay, how many people uh, didn't pay to see it but, but downloaded it illegally? And every hand went up. <laughs> and this very funny Irish writer on the panel with me said, uh, yeah, you know, people ask me, they say, uh, you know, don't you feel bad about... Uh, about piracy, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't steal a, a Cadillac, would you? And he said, if I could download it into my computer, I would. Yeah. <laughs> and it's one of those things. You know, listen, I'm not going to lie. I'm only human. I, I, I wish that all those people had, uh, had, had, uh, you know, paid for it so I could get my point oh 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 three cents per per download, you know. But uh, or whatever it is. But on the other hand. It's absolutely true. Uh, if that's what it takes to, to get a show like this known throughout the world, then that is a, I don't know if you can say it's a necessary evil, but I mean, it's a, you know, I, I, can't, I can't hate it. I gotta, be, I gotta be happy about it. So like I say, I'm Granville Island yesterday and I see a t-shirt. It's, uh, and I just, the first thing I do is smile because I'm like, man, I'm so glad this is so embedded in the zeitgeist. I don't care how it got there, you know, but, uh, but you know, it's uh, it's it's a complex it's a complex issue because it's it's not just uh, the the guys on you know the the, the guys uh, front and center you know, it's it, it you know all this kind of stuff trickles down to crews uh, the, to the to the below the line folks and all this uh, you know it, it's it's a, it's an it's a, it's a complicated issue but I you know I, I'm just glad that people know the show and whatever it takes you know. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by all this, but how's everyone feeling? You want some more from Vince, like another 15, 20 minutes? Is that good? I do. Um, uh, the, uh, another question, this is from Ryan Doucette on, um, on Facebook. Uh, Vince, never mind the fact that this event is called One Last Cook. If you were given a barrel full of money and coerced into creating one more episode of Breaking Bad, where would you take the surviving characters well, it's, it's a trap, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trap. And what, what would be some of the... <laughs> Badger would be talking about Akbar right now. And what, and, what be, and what would be some of the significant events that might occur in their lives? No, Ryan. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not falling for that. Well played, Ryan. Yeah. Um, I... <laughs> well played. Well played. Um, I, I was handed this card right before I, I, uh, I came out, and uh, I don't even uh, uh, know uh, what this story is, but, but we, we do have one more super fan, I'm told. Super fan number three, uh, Raresh uh, 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 Demofte, I hope, uh, are you here? Are you here? Oh, wow. Tidy Whiteys. Please. <laughs> Take your time. I'm not even gonna 
ask you how long you've been watching the show. Because I'm, I'm terrified that, that you don't. <laughs> Please, shoot, ask Vince anything. Vince? Sorry I don't have my gun. For the scene, I mean. Okay, here's my question. What was in your mind? What was in your mind when um, you decided, okay, Walt has to be a bad guy from a good guy? If I can translate it. I mean, what, what was the defining moment when Walt, uh, you know, uh, what, what was the first line that he crossed, really? Uh, you know, very good question. Very good question. <laughs> yeah, there was probably a good team effort there before. <laughs> is, is, that, is, that, is that right? Please let it be right. <laughs> yes? He never unbuttoned his shirt that way. That's just. <laughs> yeah, you're working that much more than Brian did. I think that's. I'm impressed. I, I, like that. I mean, my question comes to me. That's why I'm asking this question. <laughs> Answer it, Vince, please. <laughs> I think, that's a very good question, I think the moment Walt became a bad guy uh, was actually very early on. Uh, it was not the most dramatic moment of badness, uh, but it was in the uh, fourth episode of the first season. Uh, it was not, for instance, the moment where he watched Jane die or killed his first victim or whatever. I think it's the moment in the fourth episode of the first season where he gets offered, in, in deus ex machina fashion, he gets offered an out, a way out of his problems, of his financial problems. And he uh, is told by Gretchen and Elliot, uh, those characters uh, that, that, uh, that we discussed earlier, he gets uh, told that... Um, you know they're going to pay for his uh, cancer treatment. They're going to they're going to they're going to make things right for him. They're going to make him uh, financially uh, solvent. Uh, and he instead says no, thank you. And out of what seems to be perverse pride and ego, he instead uh, uh, goes to Jesse and he says, hey, uh, let's keep cooking meth. So I think that's the moment where that where that happens. Where did he go? Where did he go? <laughs> Sir, where did he go? Does anyone have eyes on the mesh? He's gone. For us. All right. Uh, thank you, though. And that shows a great deal of... Uh, I, I appreciate the, uh, the effort there. <laughs> you, you, you look great. You look great. Um, I, uh, I, 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 I tweeted this uh, earlier this week, but, um, but, but, I, but I figured I'd share it again here. So it's, a, it's a quote. And... Uh, so, so just listen carefully. Uh, when King Lear dies in Act 5, do you know what Shakespeare has written? <coughs> He's written, he dies. That's all, nothing more. No fanfare, no metaphor, no brilliant final words. The culmination of the most influential work of dramatic literature is, he dies. Do you, do you know who's, who said this quote, Vince, that I just read? The answer is Mr. McGorry. Mr. Magorium in the movie, Mr. Magorium's Wonder and Glory. Look it up, I should be not. And, and from this, this stems two questions. Uh, uh, how overtly is Breaking Bad Shakespearean? Is it intentional? Is it non intentional? Will you use words in the writer's room uh, like, uh, y'all, Skyler is Lady Macbeth now, or this is his, uh, this is his Lear moment, or his Hamlet, uh, Hamlet moment, or you know, how, how cognitive are, obviously Breaking Bad is a, tr I'm, I'm thinking probably not a comedy at this point, but, but um, you know, how, how in, intentional are the, are the Shakespearean? Um... You know, I, 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 I am not as uh, brushed up on my Shakespeare as I should be. Uh, I've read Hamlet, Macbeth, and, and King Lear in, in high school. It's been a long time. Uh, I think Shakespeare, it could be argued, is, is uh, uh, if not the foundation, one of the, I don't know, you could count them on one hand, the, the, 
three or four foundations of, of uh, pretty much most of Western literature. Uh, I guess unless you're going to go back to, to Homer or whatever. But uh, having said that, I think we, we sublimate a lot of this stuff. I, I, I can't point to the, uh, to the uh, exact uh, Shakespearean references that we may or may not be uh, guilty of. And I, I have to say, I think more in terms of The Godfather with, uh, with, with Breaking Bad, we always spoke about The Godfather, parts one and part, uh, part one and part two, in the writer's room, and we would either say, how did, how did uh, Coppola do it in The Godfather? Or we would be very proud of ourselves after having broken a particular scene. Holy shit, Jesse is Fredo. <laughs> <laughs> he is, right? Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we would break these, you know, I, it's a little uh, freeform sometimes. Uh, but uh, we, would, we would sometimes break a scene and then say, you know what, I think... Uh, we're, you know, we're very proud of a scene we broke, and then we'd say, oh, man, wait a minute, uh, The Godfather's already done this, you know. By the way, i got to give a shout-out to uh, Zach Helm, uh, writer and director of Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium, who we took a, uh, uh, I, I hope, uh, a, a gentle and good-natured uh, little uh, shout-out to uh, in our last episode. Did you see what he said this I week? I did, and he's, yeah. a, he's, I've never met him. He's like the coolest guy ever. The that greatest. was, that was, that was and, and, you know, really, I think what we liked about about having that, uh, uh, you know, we, we meant no offense. I, I, we, it just the name is so much fun yeah. to say, Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. So, so I think we wanted to hear Walter White say Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. And that's yeah. why we put it in there. Yeah. For those of you who, you know, Zach Helm, who, who wrote that and directed that movie, he was asked about the, the, the shout-out in last week's episode. And he said that he just found it completely ridiculous and unbelievable because no one would, would own two Two copies of Mr. Megorium's Winter Emporium, he's, and he himself he's does a, not even own one. He's, he's, <laughs> he's a very cool guy. Yeah, very uh, cool. I haven't even met him, but I know that just from his, uh, with his, uh, what he said on uh, Twitter or wherever it was. That, that was very cool. I've, I've, just, I've just got a couple more questions for you. Um, and uh, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about... Um, uh, about this flash forward idea, the pilot sort of starts with a mini flash forward. Obviously, it starts with uh, with Walt's confession, and then we go back and and uh, see the this, the sequence of events leading up to it. And then uh, I, I I could be wrong here. I, I haven't done my full rewatch yet, but I don't I don't think you did it again until the beginning of season two, which opened with the uh, the bear in the pool. Um, which was uh, you know sort of a a, fla a seasonal flash forward. It was almost like I this think, is. I think we did a little bit of it in that in the second to last episode of season one, where where Walt is saying, "Here's how it's going to be. We're not going to be violent. We're not going to be." But then we see the aftermath of blowing up two. Right. Yes. Place. I yeah, stand so, corrected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, but yeah. but we 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 tried not to. You know, it's like salt on your French fries. Right. You want just the right amount. If you yes. do too much, French fries don't taste good anymore. You want just the yeah. right amount of seasoning. So we tried not to rely on that on that uh, bookend bookended sort of circularity too often, but, but used it more sparingly. But, but now, obviously, here we are approaching the end, and uh, we have two uh, we've seen two flash-forwards, one that began uh, the first part of season five and, and the, other, the other that was sort of a, con uh, a continuation of that. Um, and it almost feels like, and I'm not asking you to, you to betray it, but we're, we're caught up. We can draw a, sta a straight line from the end of last week's episode and those two scenes logically follow it. I'm not saying that nothing comes in between, but so it feels like we are now in completely and totally uncharted uh, territory in terms of, uh, of where we can go. And I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about, you know, uh, that Hitchcockian idea of showing the bomb under the table yeah. creates a certain degree of suspense. Now the suspense is played out and we're just into straight up, you know, explosion time. And, uh, and how calculated was all that? You know, it's... it's, it's one of the questions, there's so many questions you ask yourself when you're, when you're breaking these kind of stories or, or when you're writing a movie script or writing a novel or a play or whatever. I mean, you ask yourself, what's, how, much, how much pure surprise do we want versus how much tension and dread? And the two, I don't know if they're mutually exclusive, but, but tension and dread derive from the audience knowing or at least suspecting what's going to happen. Pure, unadulterated surprise comes from literally not being able to guess what happens next. And, and, and 
I'm jumping all around here. I'm trying to make a, a cogent point. I, this is going to sound like a weird aside, but I think about, uh, I, I talk a lot about the, the final episode of, of one of my favorite TV shows ever, MASH. And uh, MASH has uh, implicit within its first episode, and indeed all of its episodes, the, the, the ingredients for that final episode. This is a show uh, on its face. It's about a bunch of people who don't want to be where they are. They want to go home. And in the last episode, they go home. And there's nothing, nothing really surprising about the final episode of MASH. There's some wonderful little uh, treats. Clinger stays. Clinger stays. Yeah, that's, that's ironic. A, that's, okay, that yeah. is surprising. That is yeah. ironic. But uh, there's very, there's not, it's, not, it's not such a good final episode because it is full of twists and turns and surprises. Rather, it is satisfying, at least to me it was, because it's the thing that I wanted to see all along right. on some level. So we ask ourselves a lot in the writer's room, what, what constitutes the proper ending for this particular TV show? Every, every TV show, every movie, everything has got its own proper ending that you hope you can arrive at you know, when you're plugging away on these things. So we ask ourselves a lot, is, is the best possible ending for Breaking Bad one of, of, of unadulterated surprise, or is it, of, is it giving the audience something that they, they kind of expect? Uh, you know, it, that feels fated. That, is there a certain amount of destiny or fate that feels like it should take a hand? I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not telling you what we wound up arriving at. Uh, but uh, but these then are George kinda... Master said both, <laughs> and then it blows up. <laughs> but uh, but but that's uh, these are the kind of questions um, I'm sure you guys were asking. I mean, the the, the trying to figure out how to end uh, anything, any any work of fiction but uh, especially something that's gone on as long as a TV series. Man, it's just, there's so much you got to think about. Yeah. It, it, it's not easy, and, uh, um, but I, I think I speak for all of us when, um, when I say we're absolutely sure that uh, you're going to stick the landing, and I mean that with, you know, absolute certainty. So, God bless you. Because I know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about the end because we're coming to the end of this chat, which has been incredible. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're about 72 hours away, uh, less now, like six, 48. Oh, right. It's Friday night. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and millions of people, uh, are all kind of coming up with their predictions of, of, of how it all ends how they want it to end, how it should end, this idea of inevitability that you just talked about. How aware are you of these, these theories that are, that are out there of, of you know, uh, and, and I, everybody uh, who even, you know, the, from the New York Times to, to the LA Times to Grantland is basically posting, here's what we think is going to happen uh, on Breaking Bad. Are you, are you tracking any of that? I, I am not really. I, I, I hear most of what I hear is anecdotal. I hear right. it from uh, people I work with, uh, friends, whatnot, who tell me what they've read on the internet. I, I kind of, uh, I kind of, I shy away from from reading about. I always have reading about the show on the internet. Not not because I'm not interested, but because I I am too interested. I I would I would disappear into internet land for many hours on end and, and probably not feel any better about myself afterward. Yeah. And I don't mean that we don't get a lot of lovely reactions and wonderful, thoughtful um, discussion of the show. It's just that, uh, I don't know, I, just, I, I know my own you know, mental makeup or emotional makeup. I, you know, it's, 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 I don't know, it's like a thousand good things are never enough and one bad thing it just makes you want to slit your wrist. So it's just, it's, 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 it's silly, it's silly, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, and it doesn't seem healthy, but uh, there it is, and at least I'm honest about it. <laughs> but but uh, so having all that long-winded uh, thing, uh, I have heard some of these theories, and uh, some of them are, are wonderful in their imaginativeness, and others may be pretty close to the mark, and I'm not saying which one's which, and, uh, but, uh, you know, there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of smart people out there, and, and it's very possible uh, that somebody out there has already guessed uh, some of the major plot points of this thing but uh, I'm not saying who. Huh. Um, what are you going to miss the most? I already miss the, 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 the family of the cast and crew the most. 
Uh, and that's, that's been a feeling we've had now for a great many months because we, we ramped production in, in early March, and uh, that's when the crew all pretty much said goodbye to one another in, in Albuquerque. And then we had uh, several months of post so that we, we kept the, uh, the post crew going in, uh, in, in Burbank. Uh, and then we said goodbye to them, and it's, it's been sad. Last night I had dinner with Mark Freeborn, uh, another wonderful uh, Canadian uh, who lives up here, lives in Redmond in Vancouver. And uh, my girlfriend and I had dinner with, uh, with Mark and his lovely wife Rose, and he is now a uh, production designer on Bates Motel, which is an excellent show. Uh, and um, it was it was bittersweet. We had such a good dinner, but the whole time I'm thinking, man, I, I miss this guy. I miss uh, I don't see these folks often enough now. So that's 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 the that's the answer. I miss I miss the people. But I, I think we ended the show at the right time creatively. Uh, you guys be the judge 48 hours from now. Yeah. But uh, I it's better to leave the party with with folks wanting more rather than 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 to overstay your welcome. Yeah. I mean. I, I, I think that I can speak for most of the people in this room when I say uh, I, I don't want it to end, but I'm ready for it to end. Um, and uh, that's really a testament to the amazing work that, that you and your team have done. And, uh, and this kind of brings us to our, our last question. And it, it's, the most, uh, you know, it's the most personal, but, but, I, but I do feel like you know, for all these people who, who stood in line and bought tickets to, to see you here tonight, there, this is really the only opportunity that you'll have. You'll be asked many, many questions about this show uh, subsequent to it over, uh, over the years. Um, it, it, it's, it's your legacy, even if you go on to uh, create other incredible shows. Uh, this show was so incredible that um, uh, uh, my guess is that, uh, that um, it's going to be remembered for a very, very long time. But at this moment in time, right now, last, you know, just... A, Five days ago, I'm bad with math. Five days ago, you won the Emmy. You won the Drama Emmy. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and in, and in typical, you know, Vince fashion, although all of us were absolutely convinced that that was the only uh, outcome that, that, that should occur, you seemed really surprised and flustered and, and, uh, and modest about it. And the first thing that you said when you got up there, you mentioned all the other shows and talked about uh, the, the golden age of TV and uh, so, so that happened and that's incredible and, um, and uh, there, there's still another season of eligibility but it was a great celebration and now here we are um, uh, uh, two days away from, from the show ending uh, it's going to be over, there's never going to be uh, another episode of Breaking Bad again, uh, there, will, there, there will be uh, Better Call Saul but this story is ending, it's over um, how do you feel right now? What are your feelings? Like, what, what's going on in your, uh, in your mind and in your heart? Like, uh... just, I, I'm thankful to all of you folks for showing up here. Uh, and and I, I just, it, it's hard to get your, I'm trying to put it into words properly. It's, 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 it's hard to take it all in. I mean, I look out, I see uh, 1,800 uh, fans of, of, of this show that, that in the early days I did not think had a chance. Uh, of going on the air, and then when it went on the air, I did not think it had a chance of lasting past maybe a season or two at the most. I did not foresee any of this coming. I didn't foresee the Emmy. Uh, and, and it's hard to take it all in. I, it, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the right analogy, and, and I should be able to, because that's what I do for a living is make up analogies. I, I, it fails me, uh, by it, but it... Uh, I don't feel like I'm completely processing it, even though I've had uh, uh, several months now, a great many months, in fact, to, to, to process it. But it just, it, it's, uh, you know, it's like uh, the, I don't know, I can't see the forest for the trees, but it's, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, but I, I, I thank all of you for making this show uh, a hit. Uh, you folks and, and folks all around the uh, all around the world who have who have embraced this show. I, I, I none of us uh, we did it we did it for ourselves. I'm not going to say we're not selfish, but we did it for you as much as as much as we did it for us because it's fun to make people happy and it's fun to satisfy them. And I hope 48 hours from now we we did just that because uh, it means the world to, to us to to end this thing right and to stick the landing as you say and to and to satisfy the fans of the show 
who got us to this place. And uh, it's just, uh, I just want to thank you. Well, yeah. Okay. I, I, know, I know how we feel, and, and how we feel is grateful uh, for everything, for this amazing show that's been such a huge part of our lives. So everybody, one more time for Vince Gilligan, please. One more time. Thank you. Thank you.